Okay, what have you discovered, Morris? It's been a lovely, lovely visit to uh, North Godkin. It really has. So, uh, for those who, well, most of most would know, this is the machinery site for the North Godkin mine. The North, North Godkin mine was an example in how not to run a mine, probably, if the truth be known. But it started on fairly dodgy information. And they rushed out and sold 100,000 shares at a pound each, so 100,000 pounds went into the site in about uh, 1890, 91. And here is your share certificate. If you want to have, want to have a look, but you can you can take your take your share and share it around. Uh, there you were, and you've got a hundred thousand pounds in the in the bank or on call for the uh, for the people to actually do something with the mine. So at the point they'd done a hundred thousand pounds, they'd um, had a bit of a stretch around and found a few things that they called the called a really good show, and uh, thought it thought it was a very rich mine. Uh, so the uh, the shaft was sunk and a few, a few other bits and pieces, but the main, th main thing of interest in the site was the machinery, that they decided to outlay a lot of money on machinery. How much money I don't know, but it's a significant amount. Uh, so the main, main machinery items that they bought was the winder, which is uh, this behind me, which is a two, a, a two cylinder steam engine uh, that's connected to the drum uh, and powered by the boiler up on, up on the bank. Uh, and then the winder, obviously, obviously uh, the, the rope on the winder went over to a head over the over the over the shaft, and uh, you could put things up and down the shaft. The other big issue with the site was water. Uh, that uh, all the mines in this area are very subject to flooding, and uh, there's the remains of a one pump up that way and another pump at the at the edge of the mine. I'll talk about in a minute. Let's go back in time. I want you I want you to cast your mind back to uh, Friday the 17th of July 1891, now probably most of you weren't there, uh, and this is a write up uh, out of the Mercury. So reading from the, uh, the Mercury, uh, which this was published on the 20th of July 1891, uh, Friday last was a red letter day in the White River District, it being the day set apart for starting the God Godkin silver mining country machinery, the first machinery uh, erected in this promising mining centre. On Thursday afternoon, a party of visitors, including Miss Ing, Miss Seagrave, I think they're probably here today, uh, Mr John Clark, Governor Inspector of Machinery, and many others left Waratah by coach and on horseback for the Godkin Mine. All went very well to the top of the Magnet Hill, where the coach broke down. And the passengers, including the ladies who behaved splendidly, were compelled to walk knee-deep in mud and slush for half a mile, which brought them to the point where rails are laid to the, on the Godkin Tramway extension to Waratah. Here Mr Hay, the contractor, was waiting with wagons and the whole party were soon seated and gliding smoothly down the tramway into the valley of the White River. The mine was reached about 6pm, and that actually should read the hotel I think, and after exchanging wet clothing for dry and being otherwise made comfortable, the visitors were entertained to dinner by Mr Brown, the mining manager. Covers were laid for 50 people, Mr Brown occupied the chair, Mr Godkin the vice chair, vice chair, and a sumptuous repast was enjoyed. Messrs Brown and Godkin formally welcomed the visitors to the mine, expressing the hope that one and all would often visit the district. Uh, a number of other people replied. The following toasts were proposed and responded to. The Queen, the Tasmanian Parliament, the Godkin Company, the Otis Machinery Company, the Godkin Brothers, Mr Brown, the district, the ladies, Dr Smart, the legal manager, the directors and the press. Many capital songs and recitations were given and the party did not break up till midnight, all being loud in praise of Mr Brown's hospitality and also in the manner in which the cunt, Mr. Manner in which Mr Cunningham, keeper of the new boarding house, had performed the duties of host. On Friday morning, Mr Clark made a thorough inspection of the machinery and pronounced it highly satisfactory in every way. While Mr Clark was thus engaged, the other visitors were inspecting the mine and about noon all were assembled to witness the starting ceremony. The unavoidable absence, absence of Mrs. Norman Godkin, <coughs> Mrs. Norman Godkin, Miss Ing, and Miss Seagrave set the machinery in motion. The whole plant working like clockwork, reflecting the greatest credit upon Mr. Brown and also Mr. Robert Brown, the Otis Company's engineer. Mr. Godkin declared the machinery started. Hearty cheers being called for and given for the company, Mr. Brown and his assistants, the Otis Company, the firm supplying the plant, the directors, and Mr. Godkin and the ladies. All present then sat down to a banquet here given to the visitors and employees by Brown and Godkin. Many toasts were drunk, many songs and recitations were done, the most enjoyable time being spent. The 
before breaking up, the whole company joined in the singing of Old Lang Syne and the greatest enthusiasm prevailed throughout the proceeding. Uh, one, one would imagine that there were a few by the time you've got somebody to mind the boiler, somebody to find the timber to feed the boiler, yep. uh, uh, somebody to at least run the mining machinery and the pump, and that's before you start to put people underground actually digging for them. Yeah. So, be a bit. so the machinery. Sitting in front of you is the new Otis um, freight engine, it's actually called, and that's Otis as in elevators, lifts, same company. Otis Brothers started in New York, and uh, this much of this was probably made in New York and shipped to Australia uh, to, a, to a company uh, called Austral Otis, who, uh, who they're... they're uh, their building is still standing in South Bank in Melbourne, currently painted, painted a bright pink. It came complete steam engine and just one drum, this particular one. That's the unit. The shaft that I'm sitting on actually goes across the front of it. Uh, and in just a little bit of detail. So this is a two-cylinder steam engine. Steam comes in the back and the steam makes some connecting rods go up and down which makes flywheels there and on the other side go round and round. These ones go up and drive the valve gear which controls where the steam goes at the right time. Um, what other good things can I find? If I put this on the front, imagine that that there is sitting in there. Is about the, is about the place so that you've got a, this wheel out the side that looks like a pulley and that gear there that connects to a gear down in the works. However, this isn't a pulley, this is actually the, this is what controls the actual machine. So to make the make the bucket come up or make the make the winder come up, you'd go one way. To make it go down, you'd go the other way. Up and down. This picture actually shows it with a couple of cables going away, so that that, that actually connects to the lever inside the lift, uh, the, the cage on the lift going up and down on a uh, uh, on, on a you know an, an ordinary person elevator. Whether this was operated up and down the mine, I don't don't reckon that it's more likely that it was operated by uh, somebody up the top. Um, other bits and pieces that might be of interest. This long thing here goes up and on top and connects to the regulator, so which controls the steam, which way the steam goes, and so forth. Uh, there's a counterweight lying around somewhere. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, that, that counterweight there. Yeah. That one there. Oh, which has been waved around before in the past. Yeah. It actually sits that way around, but it sits way, well, that way around, way up on top. As a counterbalance to this one down here. As far as the actual winder goes, the drum, that's pretty pretty straightforward, that the, uh, the machine drives this shaft through here. This shaft through here drives this one big cog that runs on the inside of the wheel, turns the drum whichever way you want to go. Actually a piece laying on the ground there, that large square piece with bolts each way, that uh, once upon a time bolted on there, which encloses all the valves that uh, make it open and, open and shut and make it go in whichever direction you want it to go. Okay, so as far as the engine goes, that was about it, but uh, to drive the actual drum, this shaft, uh, driven by this gear off the crankshaft, is driven, so if that goes that way, this one goes this way, across, and this big gear drives inside the drum and makes it go up and down. And the secondary gear in there is used, for, uh, connected to that gear, which makes power to uh, assist in opening and shutting the steam valves controlled by this clutch arrangement there. You might wander over here to the pump perhaps. Uh, so this is the pump that finished up at the edge of the mine. Uh, there were two pumps at the site, one was a Worthington and the other one uh, was related to Worthington but wasn't necessarily a Worthington pump. This is the one that's probably not a Worthington, and I believe it's made by uh, Austral Otis, which is the same company who provided the uh, 
the, uh, the winding engine and so forth. And on the, so on the side here it actually says Otis and Company Melbourne, which they, they might have made part of it or they might have, might have made all of it. It's a uh, reciprocating steam pump uh, and it's very much in two pieces at the moment. Um, as far as I can determine, uh, this may have stood upright on its end and there were two steam chambers, these two, sitting on that end. So if you took that tree or that man fern away and you take that end of these and put it all together, it's a substantial vertical uh, pump. Um, they were a very simple pump with no, no rotating parts, they're just reciprocating, so uh, you've got uh, one side up and one side down. So this one comes down, which allows the steam to make this one come up, and then this one coming up makes this one come up, so they go like that. And they just go back and forth and back and forth, very simple mechanically, and uh, quite, a, quite a good pump. Sadly, this has all been dismantled by people looking for the uh, brass and what have you out of it, and uh, there's very few pieces of it left. I don't have a picture of, of that one. One of the interesting things about this from a steam buff's point of view might be that it looks to be a double expansion pump where this is the steam side uh, where you've got a uh, high pressure cylinder and a low pressure cylinder there before you actually go out the other end to start driving the pump pistons in and out there. Exploring this, this, this area, uh, this little bit, uh, some of you have seen it described as a horse whim, W-H-I-M. Uh, Google horse whim, you'll find a picture of a horse walking in circles. Uh, the horse, the horse's back goes up in, up into that, or more or less, or the back end of the horse. Uh, chains hooked to that and the other side, and as you can see, the, the hooks are pretty well worn, so there's been a horse in it for a fair amount of time. Uh, and then uh, this was mounted up, up in the air, and the centre shaft of it is actually up this arrangement here. Um, so you can imagine a horse and, and pivoted about there, I would suggest, so there's a horse walking in circles round and round and round here, going that way round according to the way things are all fitting together at the moment. Um, there was talk of it being used as the winder uh, when the steam wasn't going. Um, there's also uh, some records to say that it was used for pumping as well, so you, know, you could actually uh, drive a pump and the horse swims were quite often used for pumps because you know, the horses run all the time as long as you kept feeding it. Possible that this may have even, could have even been two horses, but only one wins here, so it's hard to tell. Mm. So interesting. Probably two more under there. Mm. It's a bit hard to a bit hard to be sure when it's sort of half buried in the ground. Mm. Yeah, Kevin. Right, that's no, it's good mud. Good. That's all right. Oh, it's like it's, um, it's yeah, it's kind of yeah. We'll go a bit deeper. Yeah. Who knows what we might see? Yeah, it wouldn't. That's not, a, not much. What are your personal thoughts about this place? Are you pleased you came? Well, I am pleased I came. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised about the, the size of these these pumps, just to, just how, how big they are physically. They're, uh, they're very 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 bulky. As far as this one goes, this uh, this one, according to the plate I've got in front in front of me, is made by Henry R. Worthington from New York, and the Worthingtons were um, uh, in New in New York as their main operation for pump making back in the uh, 1880s and so forth, so this was a comparatively modern pump when it came out. It's, uh, it's comparatively a, a very complicated pump, this particular one, uh, but uh, it's got 
a number of water cylinders, three across there and three across there, and then we've got another sort of a, another selection down the other end that almost du duplicates this end as well. I think it's another. It's by the look of it, it's another reciprocating pump. But this is this is clearly the steam uh, drive for one of them. But that that end there may bolt onto there, perhaps, but or it may not. And I can't quite see exactly how it all goes together. Uh, and this is the uh, steam linkages there, and this is the usual arrangement that, uh, that, that went with these reciprocating engines and then on top. So, so complicated. So how would have those um, slats of metal fitted in? That did that fit in? They're not related. Not related? Okay, because there was one sitting here and they're not related that way. <laughs> Mm, but that's the sort of that's the sort of noise to expect. No, it's mm. not that loud, is it? No. no.